when we landed on the beach, it was just absolute chaos. I thought I had seen quite a bit in Guang, but this was, came as a shock. They hadn't yet start to bury any of the bodies. They were bloated, there were maggots, there were parts of bodies, there were people, uh, Marines that were, had no head, missing legs. There's a couple smells that you don't get over, and that's the smell of a, a fresh blood coming out of somebody. Uh, that odor of sweet blood stays with you. And the other odor that you, is that of a decaying body. Even to this day, if I uh, drive by a cemetery and if they're using recycled water, I think I can smell the dead bodies. You could get shot anywhere on Iwo. It was two by four. And they put 30,000 of us ashore and there were 21,000 of them. So you could just throw a grenade anywhere and you hit something. The bonding that goes on in the Marine Corps uh, stays with you to the day you die. Jimmy Trimble and I uh, met in the States. He was a major league baseball pitcher. He had signed with the Washington Senators, and in 1943, Clark Griffith gave him a $5,000 signing bonus and sent him to Duke. Well, Jimmy kept the $5,000, went to Duke for about a week, and then enlisted in the Marines. And Jimmy and I went through combat intelligence school together. We went overseas together. We were the best of buddies. We were tent mates. You team up uh, in a foxhole. You have, and Trimble was uh, in the foxhole with me. Our lieutenant, Stack, and our company commander, Oscar Selgo, uh, asked for uh, eight volunteers, and uh, I'll never forget him. Warren Garrett, he was the old man of the outfit. He was 24, Trimble, there was me, Corporal Reed, he was in charge of the patrol. There was McCluskey, never did find his body. There was Nitzel, he died of wounds. There was Jim White, and there was Lee Blanchard. And we set out to look for these uh, spigot mortars and see where they were coming from. We set up around uh, six o'clock in the evening. Uh, we set up two, two men on the top of the ridge with the radio. At midnight, we were to shift every six hours, and there was always to be one man awake and one man asleep. Well, nobody ever did go to sleep. The Japanese started to infiltrate, so we were right there in the front lines. The battle lasted about hand to hand combat about three hours. Thank God we had grenades the way we did. Trimble and I did the best we could to hold them off. At one point, Jimmy Trimble hollered grenades. Now the Japanese grenades didn't have a pin to ignite them. They would hit them together. And when you heard that click, you know grenades were coming. I didn't hear the click, but Trimble did, and he hollered grenades. Before that, they got close enough to bayonet them in the shoulder. Grenades came flying in right near the foxhole, and one came in the foxhole, peppered Jimmy's back, it broke both of my legs, and when I looked down, I, my crotch was just a bloody mess. I pulled myself out of the hole, and Trimble, he was still alive, and I reached in to help pull him out at the same time the Japanese had a, looked like a baseball base. It was made out of canvas. and was about the same size as a baseball base, maybe 15 inches square. And in each corner was a magnet and it was loaded with explosive. And they would put that on a tank and try to blow the tank. Well, this soldier had this strap to his body and he climbed in the hole. Of course, I saw what he had on. I rolled away, he pulled the cord, and the Japanese just evaporated, and uh, Trimble was, the whole, he was blown in half, the lower part of his body just separated completely. I was very fortunate that the two behind me, White and Blanchard, they came out of their hole. Blanchard picked me up, carried me back. White put on 
uh, tourniquets. He took my my belt, took his belt, and he did something that he wasn't supposed to do. He took his bandages and, and did both my legs. Corman uh, gave me some plasma, and they uh, they carried me uh, away down to a, a medical unit. I'm here today, 89 years old, and feel like a million dollars.